So this fourth week of Advent, we focus in worship on finding love in our differences. Let's see what that might look like. poetic words of the first chapter of John's gospel about the word made flesh and the light in the darkness we finish our advent journey through the gospels and John would want us to see the light in the midst of our darkness and become a gift for others so here it is your standing break stand up with me you're at home stand up at home too I want you to take in the deepest breath that you can take in right now Now I want you to let it out. Let's take another deep breath, the Spirit of God breathing in the Ruar. And to breathe out anything else you're carrying into this space this morning that needs to be left behind to hear this message. One more breath to make sure you've taken in the full Spirit this morning listening to this word. And breathing out the last bit of whatever it is that's keeping you away from God today. There's your calisthenics. Have a seat. Your blood's flowing a little bit more than it was before. So, Lord, come to us in these words today and speak to our hearts as we gather here and let the Ruark, the Spirit of God, flow through us from them into each one of us. And people of God said together, both here and at home, amen. So this week, I listened to one of my new uh, CDs last year. It was Bing Crosby's with the London Symphony Orchestra. He didn't really, they put it together, they mastered it, and it's amazing. It's an, if you love Bing Crosby and you love having an orchestra behind him, this is an amazing thing to pick up. And if the Gospel of John were a symphony... The McGray, who we've been looking at, awaiting on the already, says the first 18 verses would be the opening overture of a grand and majestic beginning that captures the audience's attention. It sparks their imagination and introduces the key features of the rest of the composition. And John accomplishes this with words rather than melody. But these opening verses are never less are impressive movements of music and poetry put together, which begins with a wide-angle version of the words power and prestige of Christ on a cosmic scale, and then moves to focus on the Word made flesh in Jesus. Because these verses are concentric circles, if you look at them. Beginning with the widest circle, and I encourage you to follow along with your YouVersion app and to see the notes there and answer one of the questions that I put in there for you. Beginning in verses 1, the Word who has existed from the beginning of time, who is the universal creator of all that is. And we hear these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God in the beginning, and everything came into being through the Word. And the next circle begins in the second part of verse 3 through 5, where the Word is the source of all light which God separated from the darkness. And it says, What came into being through the word and the life was the light for all people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not extinguish the light. And then it keeps zooming in in verse 9 through 11. And we discover the God who rules the earth and all its inhabitants. The true light that shines in all people was coming into the world, and the light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the world didn't recognize the light. And then God's creation continues in verse 12, 
where we finally reach the most detailed circle where God's image is given to us in a fleshy human form. The Word became flesh and made His home among us. We have seen His glory, glory like that of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Do you see something else that's similar in the Bible to the way that John is laid out? I mean, I never saw it before either, but McGray says, and, I, and now I see it clearly, I'm like, why did I never, under, why did I never get this before? But the opening of John's gospel is intended to offer a compelling parallel to the creation itself. And it reads like a beginning. In fact, if we paid attention, it even says, in the beginning is the first clue. But most of us probably haven't caught that before. That the incarnation was the beginning of a new creation and a new covenant through a divine image of human form. The Word made flesh. And if the opening of John's Gospel can be seen as an overture, like they used to have in movies all the time. And if one of the features of an overture is the introduction of an entire symphony's key themes, then there's no mistaking what John wants his central theme to be, his central key. He wants us to understand that he is the light in the darkness, in the middle of a world of darkness. And not only that, but he's a light that's so bright that darkness cannot overcome it. Amen? You see, John is constantly using the image of light throughout his gospel as a way to describe the presence and the impact of Jesus in the world. We see it in Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus that happens under the cover of darkness and Jesus describes those who live in truth as ones who come to the light in John 3. And when he teaches about himself in the temple in chapter 8, he says he is the what? The light of the world. And soon after in John 8, what does he do? He heals a blind man, removing his darkness and opening his eyes to the light. With one of the most famous lines ever known throughout history being put into a song, I was blind, but now I see. And the story of Lazarus that was reminded again this week when we sat together at Duddy Walden's funeral and my friend and brother Davis brought us the message of, the, of a tomb in Lazarus. And prior to raising his friend from death in the darkness of the tomb, Jesus challenged his disciples to walk in the light of the day to prevent their stumbling in the night in John 11. And then finally, after Jesus enters Jerusalem into the being the final week of his life, he calls his followers to believe in the what? The light. So they might live, their lives might be determined by the light, John 12, 35 and 36. And all of this leads from the very beginning of John in that prelude and how he describes Jesus' entry into the world. The light that has come into darkness and darkness cannot overcome. That's the good news of John's gospel that comes to us again during Advent. The people who walk in darkness, like us, walking in darkness for a lot of different reasons right now, not only, but including the pandemic that is getting darker and darker. And it's the reminder that sometimes the light is only visible and claimed when we have lived through the darkness of our lives themselves. This is the tie that I wore at Duddy's funeral, and you know I felt kind of self-conscious about it at first, about like, it's a little too bright, it's a little too cheerful to be at a celebration of lament. 
The reason I like this tie so much, and I actually said that in some of my words, this joy to the world tie has a lot of darkness in it. And do you realize when you look at this tie that because of all this darkness that's everywhere else, it makes what to this? It makes it stand out. The darkness is there because it shows the light even more. This tie, if it was all red and green and all merry and everything else, you would lose what the symbol of this tie is. The symbol of this tie is right here. And so whenever I remember about being and walking through darkness is, is that you have to walk through the darkness sometimes to be able to see the light for what it truly is. And maybe some of you are in that same kind of way. One of my favorite movies in the story behind it has been Apollo 13. Anybody like Apollo 13? Saw it in the theater, watched it, loved it. On April 17th, 1970, I was only four months old. Everybody's groaning now. Some of you aren't even born yet, so I won't be talking. The Apollo 13 mission to the moon finally ended after six days of darkness and a safe return but near-death experience to Earth. Well, they didn't know what had happened, but it was learned later on was an oxygen tank had exploded two days after the launch, and the three astronauts were forced to deal with limited power and a loss of cabin heat and a shortage of water, and to top it all off, a broken carbon dioxide removal system with incompatible parts because two different companies had built it. And the accident also plunged them into darkness mentally because they had to abandon their trip's purpose of landing on the moon, what they had trained for. Can you remember you trained your whole life to do something for one purpose and then all of a sudden it was taken away from you and you had nothing left but have to go back and never see what it is that you had planned to do? And so after abandoning that, they attempted a re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere that had never been done that way before. With a calculator. Because the whole entire computer of the Apollo, your TI-88 would be like 10 times better than that. But the old calculator we had, that's the computer they had. Your cell phone has more power than all the computer systems of the entire Apollo. Yeah, right? Smartwatch, right? Yeah. And for six minutes or so, they were out of radio contact. It was minutes longer than they were supposed to be. And, it was suppo- and everyone feared they were lost in the heat of reentry because, you know, in the movie, it's that really tense moment. You know they're alive, but you still feel like, oh, no, they're not going to make it. But you know they made it. But finally, they came across the radio to Houston, and they splashed down safely in the South Pacific. And Jim Lovell, the commander of Apollo 11, just a great guy, was praised for his leadership under pressure and leading his crew home. And he's also credited with saying one of the most famous phrases in our recent history, so much that it is in songs and it's become a catchphrase when things are going wrong. And what is it? Which is not exactly what he said. He actually said, Houston, we've had a problem. Main B bus undervolt. Because he was very calm about it as the whole thing was coming apart up there. That was an understatement in that moment of darkness. But it wasn't the first time that Commander Jim Lovell had found himself in a situation with impossible odds in an aircraft trying to make his way home in the darkness. What you may not know is that when he was the Navy pilot in the 1950s flying off a mission, flying a mission off the coast of the Sea of Japan, all of his instruments went faulty and they led him away from his aircraft carrier, forcing him to miss his rendezvous by several miles. And Lovell felt hopeless, lost. You ever felt like that? Looking at you, 2020. He didn't know what to do as he flew in circles in the dark over the sea of Japan. And when he tried to turn on his cockpit lights, the instrument lights suddenly shorted out and everything else went black in his cockpit. And his chances of survival were now growing even dimmer by the second. But then Lovell glanced down at the water. 
below his jet. And in the absence of life, of light, both inside and outside of his cockpit, it forced his eyes to adjust in the dark. You know how that happens? You know, when you, you walk into a place and you can't see, but then you wait a little bit and then you won't stub your toe if you'll just wait until your eyes adjust, just so you know. We like to do everything really quick. And with his newly focused vision, Lovell was able to spot a faint trail of fluorescent, phosphorescent algae, just like this. That's really what it looks like. Which had been churned up by the propellers of his aircraft carrier. And he followed the glowing trail all the way to a safe landing on his carrier's deck. It's a true story. And he says, if it were not for the darkness that swallowed him up from the night sky and the damaged electronics and the lights that all went out, he would not have spotted the radiant trail that had been there the whole time that led him to safety. And Lovell said on his return to earth later on, he says this, you never know what events are going to transpire to get you home. And that could refer to either one of these things that happened in his life. Lovell learned, whether it was through landing a fighter jet in a dark sea or splashing down on the earth from space, that sometimes you have to grow through the darkness in order to recognize and appreciate the light. Amen? Darkness in our lives is like that. Our sufferings and our hardships can, can bring and give us an unexpected change to recognize hope that's been around you the whole time, but you just couldn't see it. You see, God doesn't want us to suffer or that God caused our suffering in the first place, but God is always present in our suffering. Amen? That Emmanuel in our trials and our tribulations is offering us a new life even when we don't recognize it. And sometimes it takes that suffering to finally get us to understand that. I mean, be honest. When do you look for God the most in your life? When things are going great and everything's just going the way you want it? Or when you're in your darkest days or your struggles? So this year, especially in 2020, this season of light might seem more like darkness to you. Maybe Christmas doesn't feel very merry and bright. We don't want to deck the halls the same way that we've done it before. There are no parties to go to, at least not safe ones. Events are canceled. Everything else is distance. All of those traditions you normally do can't happen in the same way. So how do you convince yourself that this is the time for family and friends when you can't be around them? <coughs> or you just buried a loved one? Or you have over this last year or years before and you're still coping with the loss. How do you convince yourself that it is a season of peace on earth and goodwill to all people when everything we see is evidence against that? A bitterly divided country over an election and masks and the new one over the vaccine that's coming and that no harm, do no harm means different things to so many different people. How do you convince yourself? This is the season for love. When we seem so divided by our differences instead of what unites us. And that in your relationships, close and otherwise, you have seen bitterness and ugliness and betrayal and mistrust and resentment and that Facebook friends and colleagues at work and classmates at school and people in the pews next to you are divided and different from you and are choosing signs. We have to go back to the light. We have to go back to the light. One of my favorite services has and will always be, no matter how we have to do it, hanging at the greens. Because there is light literally everywhere. We light these lights and we burn them bright and we... And we turn everything else off and I try to get Davis to take all my light away and he won't do it sometimes and I want no light. I just want the light of the candles. 
So even afterwards, I'll just cut it all off and just sit in here and just stare at the lights. Have you ever done that? It's amazing to see this Christmas tree when there's no lights on around it and just pull up a chair and sit with it or go out to your car outside and pull it up and just park and look at it. And it takes away all the darkness to see these lights that are burning bright. It's the same thing looking out on a normal year at all the candles shining in the darkness on Christmas Eve. Yep, it's not going to be like that. And that's okay. It will be again. But the next Christmas, it will be again. But those lights, and we don't have to try to give each other false hope. I, I love this. Go back. For, I, I, I know, Davis, I'm pulling a fast one on you. But on this ornament, I love this is the one ornament. There are lots of ornaments like these ornaments. Go back one more. There were lots of ornaments that were out there that said all kinds of stuff about flattening the curve and cleaning everything and all this stuff we had to do. But it was really neat when this ornament came out because temperature checks, Shelly loves those. And we've got all this different stuff we have to do and everything else, stay in place and zoom and all that. But this is the only ornament that I saw that does this. Now turn it over. Every cloud has a silver lining. And on this Sunday, when we celebrate love coming down at Christmas, one of Debbie Taylor's favorite themes, McGray leaves us with this. The invitation of the incarnation is a key way for us to await the presence of Christ already among us, and that we too can and have the responsibility to reflect that same light to others. Amen? that we have already received the light of Christ, can share it and should share it with others so that those who live in darkness can see the glory of God through us. And that's what I hoped on that first Christmas seven years ago when we had our first Feed the Need, just like now that those who are walking in darkness and waiting for the arrival of Christ's light to come again to their church would finally see at Christmas a great light shine once again from this corner of Glenbrook where Good Shepherd would offer light to a world that was living in darkness and move outside of itself once again. And my friends, we have done that ever since that first time. And our friend Brian Pete did an amazing job. Someone hope beyond their wildest dreams. What if I told you it's right there in your hands? In your hands, it's hard to imagine how something so small can make all the difference, tear down the tallest wall. What if December? Look different this year
dream seven years ago. We move outside of ourselves and our debt and our brokenness and go out and be the light. We've done that. So let's keep doing it. In all that we do, all that we say, and all that we are. And so I hope this Advent journey through the Gospels has helped you to see the Christmas story in a different light. Through Mark, we want us to slow down, turn around, prepare the way for Jesus. Matthew, who would want us to confront rather than ignore the realities of this hurting world like we did yesterday and look for the Jesus who's already here. And Luke, who would want us to sing songs of obedience, of praise, and even of silence. And then John, who would want us to see the light in the midst of our darkness and become a gift for others. This is the complete story of Christmas from every one of the gospel writers' hands. Amen. Let us join together in Psalm 91 as we gather in these moments to remember once again this great song of the faith. Lord, thank you for the rest that comes when I choose to live in your shelter. I declare you alone are my refuge, my place of safety. You are my God. I trust in you. I pray you will protect me and my family from the virus. I pray you will cover me and shelter me. I thank you for your faithful promises that remind you will protect me. Help me not to be afraid of all that I hear and all that I see. Help me not to dread the virus that is terrorizing our world. And Lord, many are sick, more are fearful and anxious. Pray protection for me, my family, my church, my community, my city, my state, my country, my continent, and my world. I pray, Lord, as I make you my refuge, that no evil will conquer us nor come near our home. Pray for protection by your angels wherever I go. Lord, I love you. I trust in you. Please rescue and protect me. Thank you for answering when I call. Thank you for being with me in trouble. Thank you for salvation and the hope of heaven. And everybody both here and at home said together, Amen. Amen. Please join with me as we worship with Away in a Manger. You can stand. these words of encouragement as we depart inspired by John 1 the word is the light of all people it shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it and so that all might believe we are called to testify to this light so go forth rejoice in the love of God made manifest through the child of God go forth testify to that love and share it with all of God's creation just as God shares it with each of us 
Amen. Join me in worshiping one last time with Silent Night, Holy Night. <laughs> My friends, if I don't see you, if I don't see you, Merry Christmas. And may we all join together in remembering Christ's birth once again in the ways that keep us the safe, the best. Amen.